The following content has been provided by RWTH Aachen University. Okay, so I think we can start. So welcome everybody to today's lecture in iOS. Uh, unfortunately, Professor Boschers can't be here today because he's on a business trip. Uh, therefore, René and I will do the, uh, do the lecture today. So today is about Swift generics, dynamic data, and compositional layout. So more or less, we still are in the, um, in the stuff we have started yesterday about the uh, collection view. And we also have some small references back to the NASA project from two lectures ago. So let's start with Swift generics. Um, so when you have used arrays when yeah, playing the first time around with, uh, with Swift, you probably have declared them like you see them here. So you had a variable, here in this case it's a let, and you say, okay, we have our ints, and yeah, then you use the brackets and put the uh, integers in. Or in the case of strings, then you uh, have used yeah, the, the, the uh, apostrophes for this. Um, and what the compiler does here, it infers the type you are using in the array, right? Um, when you don't directly provide data to the array, you usually have to declare the, the, the data type you are using. And this has probably looked like this. So we had this brackets again and where we specified the data type. And um, Actually, this is not the this is not the way uh, it is implemented in Swift. This is just a synthetic sugar. So, uh, an array implementation actually can look like this. So, you have here specified that you have an array type, and then you say here in this angled brackets that the array should contain another data type. That, uh, in, in this case, uh, int, or in this case, strings. So. What we have here is that we have used a generic. So we said, okay, we want to have an error which collects multiple uh, items, and we want to have them in different uh, types, and we don't want to implement the array for each data type again and again. So in this case, we are using here those angled brackets with a placeholder. Um, in this case, it's called element, where we specify what data type should be included. And this element is not a, a class, for example, like you know from Java, the object class, or in Swift it would be the any object class. It is just a placeholder, which also ensures that always when you reference uh, to element in your code, it is the same type. So, uh, and you cannot mix different types. For example, if you would use an array of any object, you could mix integers and strings and so on, and this is what, what we didn't want it to have here in the array. So similarly, a dictionary is built up. Again, here we have now keys in a data type. We have the, uh, we have the contents. In this case, it's, a, it's an array of uh, strings. And this code would work because the compiler can infer the data type you have used there. But uh, when you don't want to provide data directly in, you, you have to specify the type of words by length by uh, Again, using here the synthetic sugar with the, uh, with the brackets, saying that you have an int here, and on the other side you have strings. And how this is declared uh, is, uh, how this is written is, again, here an alternative with the angled brackets, uh, but specified that this is a dictionary. And the Swift code for this then looks similar, like you have seen in the area before. In this case, we have two generic data types here in the angle brackets. We have the key and the value, which can be different. And here you also see another component, the where keyword. We will have a more detailed look uh, now. Oh, this. And the where key um, makes your generic data type, you can let the developer use there you can constrain this with, for example, a protocol. So in this case, we say that the key should be of type hashable. This is useful if your implementation of the methods you use in dictionary needs to, ha needs, 
this constraint to work. So in the dictionary, that the keys are, hash uh, are hashable. And an alternative way to write this down, you should know both, is uh, that instead of using the where keyword and specify, okay, key should be from type hashable, you can directly write down the hashable in, in the angled brackets. Um, this works very well for, for if you only have one protocol which should, uh, should be uh, applied here, but if you have multiple protocols, so for example, this should also be codable or something like this, uh, then this won't work. Instead, you can uh, use, you have to go to the where keyword where you then make here a colon and uh, write again key, uh, a comma, then you have to write a key double point uh, colon <sighs> code away. Okay. Um, yeah. We can also use generics for functions and methods. In this case, uh, here let's have a look at the max function, which uh, on, which gives us yeah the the larger one of x and y. In this case, we have integers, and uh, then with a simple if clause, we would uh, check which of them is larger, but. At this point, this is only working for integers. So if you want to have this also working for doubles or any other comparables, then you would have to write the method again and again. So here we again can use the generics. And uh, this looks then like this. So here with the function name, we again use the angled, uh, the angled brackets and specify our placeholder here, our t in this case. Then we say that the variables we have that they are of type t and uh, have specified that t is comparable. Uh, the comparable um, protocol helps us here to make the implementation very easy. In this case, we can very simply specify, uh, can simply, uh, very simply say that uh, which one is larger by just using the normal operands which are working for comparables. And now you have seen this for classes, you have seen this for the methods. In what you also see a lot are the protocols in Swift, and there we are also able to use generic types. In this case, we don't have the angled brackets as you have seen before, but instead we can use the associate type uh, keyword here. And here in this case, we have a protocol for RP requests, you remember for the NASA uh, example we had in the last lectures, uh, we, we had uh, URL requests. And uh, what we do here now is, yeah, we, we, we're storing the re request somehow, and we also offer a method for decoding the response. So as you remember, when we did the HTTP request, we always get data, and we had to somehow decode the data into something in which it was useful for us. And in this case, we provide this, uh, we say that we have in our protocol, the RP request, we use, we have this decode uh, function which have to be implemented and which throws out our generic type we have specified here. Um, we also will have a look at how this is implemented and how this is called uh, right now. But uh, before we, have an implementation of the protocol. Uh, I want to show you then how to use this protocol in another function call. So again, we have here a generic function for, uh, for sending the request, which takes a request, which is one of our RP requests. So again, we, as you have seen with the marks example, we have specified the generic type with the name and then provided the uh, parameters. And what is returned here in this case is the request response. So what we, what we have specified here. And just to have this complete, uh, here is also how this function would be implemented in our example of the NASA uh, picture of the day example. So, but this is code you already have seen in the last lecture. So this is just, yeah. Uh, having this asynchronous call for uh, with the URL request, 
Um, and if we, we send this out and we get uh, 200, then we will continue, otherwise we will throw an arrow, error. And uh, in this case, we then also directly call the decode response, uh, the decode response um, method we have defined before we have specified here that our protocol needs to use this and return whatever comes out here, so whatever the response is. And let's now have a look how this is, how the protocol is implemented. So with the, which originally had the associated uh, type keyword, we see here now our photo info RP request, uh, which is uh, implementing our protocol. And yeah, we have the RP key, uh, we have the URL request, which is here computed property. Um, and the, the most interesting part is what is happening again here with the decode response because there we had our associate uh, data type. And uh, yeah, as you can see, we have replaced the, uh, the response here with the photo info model you have seen last lecture. So that's it um, for this and then uh, we just have to, yeah. Uh, we have here just the code as you have seen yesterday how to use the JSON decoder to make this uh, to a photo info um, object. And having this, then we can very simply make the whole URL request with the generic function we have uh, seen before. We, we just uh, initiate our object and then we just uh, use the method you have seen before with the, with the whole code for the HTTP, uh, HTTP uh, request with our, with our instance of the uh, RP request, and then we can handle the results somehow. So, when you remember from, uh, from yesterday and from the lectures before, we have, uh, we, we got this photo info object, but also the RP provided us with an URL for an image. So here then you can see the power of the generic uh, protocol because now I can simply create another RP request object which is then just when we get our HTTP request, it is giving us directly an, another response type which is in this case a UI image. And then as you can see here on the right side, uh, we can use this with the same function as uh, as before, without writing another request method for the for the uh, case with the UI image here, um, and directly use this. So what is happening here in general is we get the photo uh, info object uh, as you have seen before on the slide before, and with the URL which is included in uh, in the photo info object, we just start another request on the, in the same way you have seen before uh, to get an image and. Since this code was uh, implemented in the playground, we can simply write uh, image here to display the image too. But otherwise you could, for example, show this image now in the image gallery you have implemented uh, in your app or something like this. Okay. So now after you know what generics are, uh, we can continue with the whole collection view example from last lecture, because there we use, the first time we use uh, generics there. And um, also what you have seen yesterday in the demo is that René implemented a search controller to, yeah, to filter his data. And we will have again a short look at this and uh, we'll quickly talk about this. What you have not seen yesterday is that you can also use another view controller uh, for showing the data, then it will look like here on the right. So as soon the person is typing, you see you have another, uh, another view shown here on the bottom. And what you also have not seen yesterday is um, René was using the re reload data method to update the user interface. And at some point this was very abrupt, so the changes were happening very quickly without any animations. This did not look that nice. And today we will look how you can make this a bit more pleasing with nice animations 
yeah, uh, such that it looks, for example, like here in the shortcuts app. Okay, um, so a quick look at the code you also have seen yesterday when we implement the search controller like Rene has shown it to you, uh, to you, then you use a UI search controller, you specify the delegates, in this case it's the, uh, it's probably the view controller where you are writing the code, and um, then you just say to your navigation item that, uh, to the search controller pro uh, property that uh, this object is your search controller. One line here, which might be new to you, I'm not sure whether René has shown this to you, is the obscure background during presentation property. Just a nice, uh, nice uh, feature with this uh, pre-implemented method, um, which dims the whole user interface uh, when you are starting this, uh, to search such that, for example, suggestions and so on are a bit more emphasized in the user interface. But in this case, uh, we didn't want to have this effect, so we set this to false. And when you uh, now want to have an implementation like you have seen in the contacts app uh, in the slide before, then you can specify another view controller to, uh, to this, uh, you can specify another um, view controller, and here when you're initializing the UI uh, search controller, you can just add this new view controller for showing, for having a different view than, uh, than uh, the one which is showing when no search was done. And the requirement for doing this is that the view controller you have used here, which is in this case, assume that it's already implemented, that this is included in the navigation controller somehow. Um, yeah. And then after having setting up the search controllers and setting them to the navigation item, then at some point you're coming to the, play, uh, to the method where you are writing the filtering mechanism. And this can then look, for example, like this. Very simple, you should be familiar with this. We have an if let, check whether we have, uh, in our search controller, the search bar has some text and whether it is empty. If it is not empty, we do the filtering with the filter closure. Otherwise, uh, yeah, with a predefined method which helps you identifying non-case sensitive characters within your string. And otherwise, we just show the, the complete data set we have. But now, we, we, we arrived at the point where we want to reload the data. And what yesterday happened was um, René called the reload data method, which in this case just updated uh, the, the whole uh, collection view very abruptly. And to make it with the smooth animations you have seen uh, in the example before, there you have multiple other ways. One way is to use this method here, the perform batch updates method. But uh, the problem with this one is that for each insertion, removal, and moving items and so on, you have to uh, specify all the movements and operations by yourself, which can get complicated even for senior developers. So for example, when we have a look at this data set, only seven items with different uh, animals here, and our data changes for some reason. May it be user interaction, may it be uh, that the server has updated and uh, has removed elements, uh, or whether you have filtered, like with the search view you have seen before, then your update data can look very different, for example, like this. So what happened here is that we have the cat removed, we have the dog removed, and also the elephant. And then when we look at the fish, you see the fish stays at index four. So instead of maybe uh, yeah, moving the fish element to the top because the first three items were removed, um, you, yeah, uh, something else happened, and what happened is that the horse was moved, the giraffe was moved, and the monkey was moved to the locations before. And as a developer, then 
you have to implement all those cases by yourself, which is very error prone and not recommended. Uh, and by the way, also the sugar glider was inserted and honestly, I have no idea what a sugar glider is. I wanted to look that up and show you an image I forgot, sorry. Um, so this can get complicated, can lead you to, to uh, can very quickly lead to uh, your app crashing, which is something you definitely want to avoid. And of course, we also have a bit simpler method uh, than implementing it this way, which are datable data sources, uh, diffable data sources. So the, the, the types we will see here in the following very often is once the UI collection view diffable data source and the NS diffable data source snapshot. Um, the first one handles the whole um, animation stuff and so on. And the snapshots uh, are con containers for your data. And what you also see here, so are again generic data types. So th those, we have a generic data type for the section identifier and one for the item identifier in both cases. Okay, so as I mentioned, the snapshot uh, is a container uh, for your data source and the UI, uh, the UI collection view diffable data source um, handles the, the changes. And this class allows you to do insertions, removals, and uh, moving your items, but not only the items, but also the sections you have seen. So if you remember, Phil and René showed you yesterday that we have in our collection view, we have sections and uh, items. And um, one thing that what is different here is instead of using index paths, as you are, for example, used in table views or have seen before, this is working with uh, with those identifier types here, with on a semantic level, which is very helpful when you don't always have to consider, okay, what, at what index was an item which avoids uh, five point exceptions there. Um, but the constraint when implementing this is that, again, the identifiers must be of type hashable. Okay, so let's have a look at the, an example how to use the UI collection view diffable data source and the NS diffable data source snapshot. Sorry, I will have to read this every time. Um, so what you see here in the beginning is we set up an, a first data set. Uh, here we have, we are defining our UI collection view diffable data source. Uh, in this case, our identifiers are of type strings. And uh, yeah, we pass as argument the collection view. And then here we have the closure to yeah, configure the cells. Uh, you have seen this yesterday already, and also René will show you today again a, a more advanced example than yesterday. And uh, then we add our data. And this we are doing here by using the snapshot. So we have here a variable, the original data set, which is a snapshot, again, uh, this has to be the same, uh, those have to be the same types as for the diffable data source, so string and string. And yeah, what we do is as you are used to from the collection yesterday, we add a section. In our case, it's to the main section and we just use, uh, use the, the, the word main here. And we add, uh, add our items by using append items and add the data set you have seen before on the slide. So cat, dog, elephant, and so on and so on. And to make now our first animated insertion of items, we simply then say, okay, our data source, data source, which is here defined before, apply the following changes and, uh, uh, and add, and uh, yeah, handle somehow our snapshot and make, and in this case with the animating differences too, also animate how those changes are presented to the user. We also have a completion uh, clause as nearly with every, uh, every function you have seen in the last slides and last lectures. And so what happens now if we want to make the operations we have seen on the slides before? So if we want to, for example, to remove the first three items, if you remember, what we do is we make a copy of our snap, uh, of our uh, 
of our data set, which is stored in the data source, and get the snapshot. And then we, uh, it provides uh, some methods, and one of those are delete items, and then we can specify what items we want to delete by the identifier we have specified. So in this case, cat, dog, and elephant. And to have this animated in a nice way, yeah, we again apply the, uh, the new data set, which is here updated in this case, and we make this animated. And this is also working for moving the items, so moving the horse before the fish. Um, and again, we, have, we are applying the changes. We uh, can do this with the, uh, we can also, uh, this is exactly the same again, <laughs> and, but with a giraffe and a horse, and here also um, with the monkey and giraffe. And then we have done the changes you have seen before in the table. So uh, here you have now seen how we have done this step by step, assuming for example a user have yeah, removed the, uh, the single items in your application, but we can also do the same with a, with a larger data set. So as we have included here a huge set of, uh, of items, uh, we can also make this with an update function. So we can just specify, okay, here we want to have a new snapshot. We again want to have the section main, and we want to have to append the following items with a sugar glider and so on. And uh, this should of course go to section main, and then the data source will uh, will handle this and ma makes a nice animation for you instead of doing all this stuff by yourself. Okay, so. Um, so that's about the difficult data sources. René will show you much more in, uh, in the demo about that. He will review uh, a larger project where we have a look at the uh, collection view and where we have a look at compositional layouts. So just to get into the topic back, so we have a collection view which allows us to have customized user interfaces. And if you remember, we had there certain groups, and René has made this little example here with you, and the collection view allows us, and the compositional layout there allows us to have multiple sections, have a uh, combination of different groups and different items in this collection view, and with us create very, very complex user interfaces, and the one René will discuss with you is the one you see here on the right side, where we have, yeah, where we, have, where we can scroll upwards and downwards, and you see we have here yeah, trending games, we have, we have here yeah, a set where uh, certain apps are promoted, we have popular uh, apps and essential apps, and then the views look very different for all of those uh, categories, for those sections. And for this, we will have a deeper look at how collection views and the compositional layout works to create a user interface like this, which is, by the way, an adoption of the App Store. Um, and for this, I hope you remember from yesterday, uh, the UI collection view consisted of items, groups, and sections. We had the sections also with the uh, different data sources. And uh, your layout can have multiple sections with multiple groups and in that, of course, also multiple items. And, and uh, yeah, let's start with, uh, with the smallest part there, the items. Uh, for defining an item there, you have, uh, to speci uh, you have to first give the item a certain size. And this we do here in this case with uh, NS collection layout dimensions. You have seen this yesterday. I think René has used the fractional width, right? The fractional ones. Yeah, the fractional ones where the width and the height is defined by the size of the container. So in this case, if you have said, yeah, the fractional width of your item should be is uh, 0 0.5, it's in percent, then it is half of the width of or height of the containing element. Um, alternatively, you can also don't use this absolute uh, size, uh, those absolute dimensions. Uh, 
the relative dimensions and use absolute ones. First of all here, the absolute one where you can specify that, for example, your item should have, you know, 40 pixels. Or what you can also do is the estimated one where the size is also com uh, computed during the runtime to adapt, for example, embedded items. And then for specifying the size, yeah, you can simply do call it like this here with uh, the parameters in this case of the width of the dimension or height of the dimension. And with this, we can in initiate our first item. So as you, this is the code from the slide above. Uh, before, where we had a friction width of one and uh, an absolute uh, height of 44. And um, you can now create an item, which is the basic building block we have in collection views and this with the size parameter here. Um, and the NS collection layout item is the basic class here for the collection view. So in the following, you will see, for example, the groups, which are actually a subtype of the layout items. Also, when we have later on decoration, those are all subclasses of the layout items. Okay, so as you have used yesterday, uh, we, the, the next uh, step in the hierarchy are the groups. And yeah, the groups can contain multiple items. Um, and for this, you need to define uh, an axis. You need to define uh, the items inside and uh, the size of the whole, of the whole thing. So, um, for the axis, you can have horizontal and vertical, which is, yeah, as you are used to, the two directions. But what you can also do is you, you, you can implement um, the custom axis. And th this you can use, for example, for a slanted arrangement of the items or, for example, to make ra uh, radial buttons uh, or radial menus in this case. Um, yeah. And then, Next, we have the sections. Um, so the sections are also the ones we have seen in the Diffable demo and so on, where, um, which are directly uh, represented in the collection view. And uh, the sections always only include one group. If you want to have multiple groups in your, coll uh, in your collection view, then you need to embed multiple groups into one but the section only has one. And with the section, you can also uh, implement scrolling behavior if you want to have orthogonal scrolling, like uh, you have seen in the example where we could swipe horizontally uh, additionally to the normal vertical scrolling. And let's have a small look at what is possible there. There again with Swift where we have many possibilities to, uh, predefined possibilities to make this such that you don't have to write your own animations. We have obviously no scrolling, but uh, what we also have is continuous scrolling where you uh, just swipe and it goes on and it goes on, but also continuous group leading boundary uh, scrolling, which is the same as the one before, but instead of yeah, just finishing when you don't have any momentum anymore, it always snaps to the leading edge of uh, a group. And additionally to this, we have also the paging scrolling behaviors. This is when you really have the feeling of distinct elements and you have quickly swiped through them. It is not feeling like, yeah, you, it always continues, but you always have these discrete pages to show. And there you again have different scrolling behaviors. So uh, here in the group paging, it always uh, similarly stops to the leading edge of a group. And in the paging centered, you, uh, the, the group is always centered in the view frame you have. Okay. Um, then back to our code here on the right side. Finally, we have defined our group. We have our items, we have our groups, we have our section then we add this to the layout. And uh, one thing you can, should definitely see here, so in this case, the layout with the 
UI collection, your compositional layout has only one, uh, one section here defined. So if you want to have multiple sections, we have to do it somehow differently. And this is where the section provider closure is used. So instead, you can define your layout like you, have, you can see here. So uh, you have a collection view compositional layout um, and a closure which takes a section and a layout environment. The section is the index of your section and the layout environment gives you information about the width and so on to, uh, to, to uh, configure everything properly. And then by the index you have here in the section, then you can specify how your, what section should be used here such that you get very different uh, yeah, sections within the one collection view. So as you see here in the example, we have here the, uh, the larger uh, squared one items and here a smaller list which scrolls horizontally. Okay, um, and finally, I, um, René has also showed this to you um, already a little bit. You can also switch diff uh, to different layouts. So for example, if you, have, you can switch between simple lists and grids, but also do other fancy stuff. For this, um, you can define the whole thing in a variable um, and then use the function set collection view layout and also specify again whether it should be animated or not. And then this happens with a just completely new layout then. Um, but you can do this with the same items. But again, René has shown this to you yesterday, so I won't go too much into detail there. Uh, finally, again, some, some, some nice add-ons we have here. All those items can be decorated, so you, have, you can use NS Collection Layout items to add to items, such for example here like this reload button. Um, those can be added either to the top, to the leading, to the left, or to the right. Um, and if this pre those predefined uh, positions are not perfectly working for you, you can always use offsets to, to, yeah, to move them a little bit such that this is appealing to you. Um, and the same is also working for sections. So for sections, you can provide uh, headers and footers, for example. Um, also, something you will see in the demo. So in this case, uh, you can see here how a new item is created, which is, by the way, again, um, a subclass of the, the item, uh, item class you have seen before, which again gets a size and then uh, here gets uh, registered, no, gets called as uh, with his uh, element kind uh, specified where the item is specified. This is necessary if you register your items via code. And again, this is all happening also in the demo, but we want to speak uh, about this a bit uh, earlier. And then you can add the decorations uh, by, by uh, using the boundary supplementary items uh, property of the section and uh, yeah, use this. Um, and similarly, you can do this with, uh, with item backgrounds. Therefore, you use the collection layout decoration items with an, uh, with an element kind uh, which is used for when you registered this cell and can specify the decoration items for the section. And in this case, you have to, you have to register this uh, here for the layout again. This content was provided by RWTH, Aachen University.